<clears throat> all right, good morning attendees as we all file in. Thank you so much for coming in today. We're gonna give everybody a couple minutes to settle into the webinar. We have a great group of people coming in today. We have 48 people register for the event, so we're really looking forward to see how many attendees we have. As everyone's filing in, as a reminder, uh, please use the Q&A for questions during the session, and please use the chat feature for any technical help that you may need. While well, they're streaming in. I had to say hello to Frodo Lives. I don't know who Frodo Lives, but Frodo has been to a couple of our sessions, so welcome, Frodo. I've always wanted to say that, so thank you for making that happen. <laughs> All right, we're sitting pretty with about 32. We're going to give it a couple, just a couple more seconds. For our new friends who are joining us, as a reminder, please use the Q&A area down at the bottom of your screen for questions and answers, and we'll make sure that we get those answered either during the program or at the end. And the chat feature down at the bottom for any technical details or need technical help that you may need. All right. Sally's here. Hi, Sally. Sally sent me an, an email this morning that uh, we were having a couple issues with Zoom, so I'm happy to see that you're here, Sally. Excellent. All right, well, one more minute, Miss Tina, and we'll get ready to, to grab and go here. Absolutely. Excellent. All right, do we have a question and answer? Oh, so Gail, Gail said my World War I presentation was great. Thanks, Gail. That was really kind, thanks. I know, she had like monster numbers. Congratulations, I, Deb. Thanks, I had like 600 people or something. It was insane. I mean, I guess that's what happens when people can't go anywhere. They're kind of held hostage. They would <laughs> listen to you anyway. That's not true. That is absolutely true. <laughs> that is not true at all. For those of you tuning in today, you have to realize this is extremely hard for Deb and I because we need a live studio audience. We can't oh. do our song and dance when no, nobody can see us. Oh, I know. But I miss all you guys so much, and I miss seeing all of your bright faces. So, but I'm just happy that you guys are all here. That's what's important. All right. Well, we're sitting at 40 attendees, Miss Tina. So uh, just one more, one more, uh, one more. Oh, where's the chocolate? Agreed. Nancy I wants know. to know where all the chocolate is. Oh, Nancy. See, all I right, can't friends. bring you guys goodies if I'm, you know, sheltered in place. Totally. All right, friends, just one more reminder uh, that uh, before we get started, please use the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen for questions and answers during the session. And uh, please use the chat feature if you're having any technical problems. Mr. Jeffrey Fisher is on the back end helping us through this webinar and Tina and I are here. So uh, without further ado, I wanted to say thank you to everybody for coming to the session today. Uh, this is Deb Dudak calling, uh, you know, beaming into you from the beauty of cyberspace with a brand new Wi-Fi booster. So my Wi-Fi is working perfectly again. And with us is our guest speaker, Tina Baird from Tamarack Genealogy. Please put your virtual hands together for Tina and she's gonna walk us through family search digging deeper. Please take it away, Tina. Thanks, Deb. I appreciate it. So thank you to Deb and thank you to Jeffrey, our wizard, who is going to make sure that everything goes smoothly today. And thank you to all of you for being here this afternoon. It keeps Deb and I off the streets. And, you know, since we can't really do that at the moment, then we have to find other ways to entertain ourselves. So hopefully you've been finding some ways to entertain yourselves by spending some time researching your family tree and hopefully digging deeper into some of these websites that maybe you just hadn't had the opportunity to do previously. So Family Search is no exception. It's a site that is kind of ubiquitous. You know, we use it all the time, but we might not know how to, to kind of get beyond the basics, how to dig a little deeper and find um, some, some new records, some new collections, some new ideas that you didn't know existed. So if you had been tuning in the last couple of weeks, then you have listened to Maureen Brady and Jennifer Warner talk about using the catalog and using Research Wiki. I'm not going to cover the two of those today. Um, what I'm going to talk about are the other search options that you have under Family Search. So I'm going to talk about the historic records collections predominantly. 
Then I'm going to talk about their image collection, the family trees, the genealogies, and searching their books. But the vast majority of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be using the historical records collections. That is that database that when you click on search and you want to look up a name, that's the place where you're going to go. So those ideas that we're going to cover, again, we're going to cover the different types of records, images, family trees, briefly genealogies. I'm really just going to mention what those are, and then their book collections. So a couple of things that you may have noticed, but you may not have realized the significance of are those little cameras that you see when you go into the historical records collections. So what we have access to aren't just those indexed records like the U.S. federal census um, or Cook County marriages, but they also have a tremendous amount of non-indexed browsable collections as well. Um, and that's kind of where these camera features come in. So if you see a camera that has a little line above it, it means that it's indexed, that it has images, but that those images live on a partner site. So for example, the Alabama Civil War Service records, if you were to click on that, it would tell you that that original collection lives at Fold 3. The same would be true if you were looking at Find a Grave or Billion Graves, or if you were looking at Cook County death records, they would take you over to the Cook County site. So that little line above it, means that they're indexed, there are images, but that they're on a third party, an outside site. If there's a camera with no box, that means that those are images that are indexed with images on Family Search itself. So the Alabama County marriages, those are ones that are available directly through Family Search by clicking on the database and searching for your name. If there's no camera at all, it means that Family Search has indexed it on their site, but there aren't any images attached to it yet. What this doesn't talk about are those browsable collections. Those are the ones that have the cameras, but there's no actual index to them at all. And I'll talk about those a little later on. So if you're searching family search, how many of you are taking the time to search directly by location? I do it a lot when I'm looking for something specific. I do a lot of research in the UK, so does Deb. So I would click on the UK, it would bring up the map, it would ask me which country would I like to view, I would choose that country and it would show me the You know, we seem to have lost your audio there for a brief moment. In general, I would have that. Gina? Yeah. We lost your audio there for a moment. So if you could back oh. up a little bit. You got me? Yep, we're good. You need, me, you need me to start over with location? That sounds like a good idea. Okay, so if you've ever used the search by location, that's where you click on, you hover over the map and you click on the continent or you click on the, the country that you're interested in. It's gonna bring up the list of resources that are available by country or by state. So if you were to click on that for the United States, it would bring up each state. If you were to click on Illinois, for example, or Alabama, then it would show you all of the research collections that are available that have indexes or that are browsable by that particular state or county or country. So really searching by location is a great way to kind of drill in and dig a little bit deeper into the types of collections that exist. Because if you just go to the search historical records and you put in your name and you don't sort by anything else, you don't sort by residents, you don't sort by parents, it's going to give you a huge number of results that somehow can, you know, or has the potential to bury, you know, what you're looking for in this enormous forest of trees. So if you click on United States, you can search by all of the records that are for the entire United States or have some aspect of that in it. And across the top, it gives you the option to sort by title, to sort by record collection size, or to sort by last updated. And typically, people aren't aware that they can sort these collections in that way. And I highly recommend you take the time to play around with this a little bit because if you sort by last updated like I did in this instance, it's gonna tell me that they've been updating collections all week. So I see that they've updated the deceased physician's file, they've updated genealogy banks obituaries, you know, they've recently updated Native American records and rosters of revolutionary war soldiers. So if you might not have looked at that collection for the last several months, it would definitely behoove you to go in and take a look to see if there's anything new. 
You can also sort by record collection size, and I will talk about that in a couple of minutes when I talk about just browsing record collections. Um, and of course, you can always sort by title, which is going to bring it up either alphabetically starting you know, with the A's or it's going to bring it up in reverse. So anytime you're going to look at a collection, you want to make sure that you don't just jump right in and put in the first name and last name and begin your search. So if I go back a screen, let's say, you know, I see Illinois County Marriages here or Illinois Cemeteries and I were to click on that and it tells me the last time it was updated was March 30th, 2020. I might be, you know, just eager to go in and put, you know, James Craig in and see what comes up. What I recommend that you do before you do that is read the description at the top and find out exactly what types of records are being collected. What is the scope? What is the point of this particular collection? Does it include the time period I'm looking for? You know, does it, is it an A to Z inventory? How am I going to find my ancestors in this collection? When you click on the little learn more button, it's going to take you to the wiki page. I'm going to show you what that looks like in a second. And what that's going to tell you is some of those those details. It's going to give you the scope, it's going to give you the size, it's going to give you the breadth and the date range. From there, I might find out, oh, this doesn't even cover the decade that I'm looking for. I'm not going to waste my time searching for a name because it's not going to be there. And at the very bottom, we have a tendency to overlook it, but it says browse through 5,040 images. I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute as well, because sometimes it's not just about searching the every name index, it's about browsing the images as well. So by clicking on learning more, I get that description that I saw on the previous page that, you know, these are records spanning 1853 to 2009, that it's an ongoing project, but then it gives me a little bit of the history in the background. You know, what is going to be in this collection? It's going to be birth date, death date, deceased name, plot location. It's going to tell me a little bit more about how to view the images. It's going to kind of fill in those gaps on how to make sure I get the most out of searching that particular collection. And when you're dealing with collections that are huge in scope, Cook County marriages, 1880 federal census, you really want to take the time to take a look at that learn more because you want to make sure that it's going to have the information that you're hoping and expecting it to provide. So now what about browsing? So I went in first, I did a search on Sophia Hayes, just in the every name index there on the page, and it brings up one result. So in that result, it tells me that you see at the top of the screen that Sophia K. Hayes was buried on March 2nd, 1957, you know, and I can click on the little icon to view the image. That's what you see directly below. So when I click on her name, it tells me that Sophia Hayes, you know, is buried March 2nd, and it gives me the lot and the the grave location so that I would be able to find it on the cemetery log, but it's not providing me with any additional information. By taking just that one extra step and clicking on the browse link, I find a lot more information. When I click on browse, it shows me what the record description is. I can look at the individual cemetery interment cards. I can look at the index A to Z and find additional information. By clicking on in the center where it says Elmwood Cemetery Interment Cards, I clicked on those cards and kind of just browsed through them to see what type of information they provided. And I found this record for Sophia K. Hayes. This didn't come up when I put her name into the search box. I only found it by browsing the collection. And every time you browse the collection, it's like shelf reading at the library. You go to the library and you're looking for cookbooks on grilling, you know, but while you're standing there browsing the shelf for grilling, you might find things on roasting or things on baking or things on Mediterranean style cooking. And it really broadens and deepens your experience. The exact same thing is true for online collections. If you have the ability to browse that collection, it really is worth your time to just take an extra couple of minutes to see if you might find a gem like this one. All I got out of the original record was that Sophia Hayes had died on and was interred on March 2nd. By browsing, I find out you know, who her daughter is and her son-in-law is, you know, that she's listed, she has a headstone and it's listed as mother on this particular family plot. So Hey, hey Tina, I hate to yeah. interrupt. My apologies. So yeah. we had a question from Pauline. Um, okay. the, the, she wanted to know, um, could you go back to the browse link that's underneath that record set, how to get to that again? Because it oh. seemed a little small. 
This one here? Yeah. Yes. So when you're looking at the record collection, if it's a browsable collection, if it has that little camera when you were searching for the record titles, so you see on this screen you have all the cameras. If there's a camera there, then it means it's browsable. So at the bottom of the screen, you would be able to click on that link and it would take you to this page that I cropped at the top. And from there, you would be able to choose. So I'm going to show you a couple more examples of that as I go along. So you'll be able to see what a browsable record collection would look like. This is just an example of one showing specifically Sophia K. Hayes. So hopefully that answers your question, Pauline. Yep, looks so. Thank you, Tina. So searching by location can be really, really useful to you because you can find some of those gems that you didn't know existed. Um, so for Illinois, for example, I think there's 164 collections. Some are database with indexes and some are just browsable collections. Um, like I said, Deb and I do UK re research. I think there were 64 for Scotland. Um, but what if you don't know? What if you have absolutely no idea exactly what it is you're looking for? You don't know where they lived or they lived in more than one place. Sometimes just browsing the collections right underneath research by location on the right hand side, you can find a collection. So you can search by keyword. So you can put in US and see what's there. You could put in World War II and see what's there. I just put in card to see what types of card collections or what types of files might exist. And I get you know everything from cemetery card files to draft card files to immigration card files. So you don't have to limit this to a specific location. You can't really search this by title, by person. So I wouldn't be able to go in and put James Craig and it would show me record collections unless it was his own collection. Um, but it would be useful to search for things like Masonic Lodge records, railroad employment records, um, immigration and naturalization card files, marriage certificates, things like that. So it's a great way to find out what types of record collections exist to help you dig a little deeper. Again, you can sort it the exact same way. You can sort it by size of the collection, you could sort it by last updated, and you could sort it by title. I did my sort by collection size. So I clicked on that link at the top that said records. The first time you click on that, it brings the largest collections up first. So you're going to see US federal census eight, you know, eight million records or something like that. And then the collection sizes are going to get smaller from there. If you click it one more time, it reverses it. So you get the smallest collections and you get the unsorted collections or what they what you would call an unpaginated record collection. So those are collections that are browsable but aren't searchable with an every name index. Those don't exist. But there are some absolutely amazing things in here. So for example, I just chose one. I just chose the Arizona Maricopa County probate records that are listed in that list as when I clicked on records and it sorted it by size, that came up um, at the bottom. Pauline, back to what you were asking about how do you find that browsable collection. When I clicked on that link, Arizona Maricopa County Probate Records, it brings me to a page like this. And this is just one of several pages. And how this is broken down, as you can see, is by year and case number. So if I knew that I had somebody in Arizona that had passed away um, in 1880, I could try to find it this way. Or if I had a reference in another document that referenced a probate, like let's say a land sale that gives a probate case number, I would be able to go directly to that collection to find that particular probate case. So for example, the one that I have highlighted, it's a single case and it's, it gives me the probate case number that it's P3510. When I click on that, then it brings up the file for me to be able to browse and download. So I'm looking at image number two. Image number one is that start screen that you see on a lot of microfilm images from Family Search. That's the begin of, beginning of the microfilm reel. So image number two is page one to that particular probate packet that is for Stephen Fazio. So I would be able to page through Stephen Fazio's probate case and download those pertinent records. So sometimes going in and searching by collection and just kind of going through those browsable collections can have a huge impact 
on your genealogy and on your family research. So let's say I don't want to do any of that. I just want to do a search on my great grandfather. And we've all done this. We've gone to the search historical records. We've put in first and last name in the boxes and we've hit search. You'd be surprised at the difference in results that you're going to get by just searching on the name without using any filters and what will happen to your research and the quality of your research when you take the moment to step back and start using the filters that Family Search provides. So I went in and I did a search on my great grandfather, George Key Middleton. I put in George, George Middleton. I didn't even put Key in the first time I searched. And I got something like 8 million results. Well, obviously that's not gonna help me. 8 million results is gonna be way too many to go through at any, any one sitting. So I decided that I was going to fill in what I knew, which is exactly what all of us do when we're doing our research. So I went in and I put in his name. I put in that he was born in New York. I put in the date that he was living in Illinois, who his wife was, who his father was, who his mother was. So I kind of broke that out on the screen on the right for you and clicked on search. It brings up 561 results. The first four pages I clicked through, not a single one of those records were my George Middleton. So what's the point? What is the point of going in and putting all of that information if it's not going to sort it and give me the results that are going to be pertinent to the research that I'm doing? Here's where the filters come in handy. So at the top of the screen, right past the little red box, you'll see a little link that says filter by collections. It's also on the left-hand side, so under where it says search by spouse or search by residence, if you scroll down a little further on the page, you have the option to turn on those filters as well. And if you haven't used those filters before, it is an absolute game changer to your research on family search, and I'm gonna show you why. So here's an example of the type of collections you can search, you can filter by. So even though collections doesn't have a little arrow next to it, if you were to click on collections, it would show you a whole list of potential collections that you could utilize. Vital records, immigration records, church records, military records, you'd be able to choose the collection you were looking for. If you don't want to narrow by collection, but you know where they were married, you could choose it. If you have the location where they were living, you could choose it. So a lot of people get discouraged and they think it's not helpful because it says, well, there's 13,000 United States results. But if you click on United States of America, that breaks out further to where you can choose individual states. And then it'll break out even further once you choose a state and it can break it down into county or to territory or into township in some instances. So don't just stop at, oh, there's 5,000 records for the UK, that's not gonna be helpful to me. If you click on that, it'll give you the option to drill in even further. You can narrow your search down by sex. So I have people in my family, you know, where the men are named either Leslie or Marion. It's so easy to just go in and filter out females so that I'm only getting men named Leslie or that I'm only getting men named Marion to help me in my research. And you can even layer those filter results. And I'll show you an example of how that can work for you as well. So I went in that general historical records collection search without any filters. I went into the records, I put in George K. Middleton in Residence Place, Illinois and I got zero. Now I know George lived in Illinois for a number of years, but when I search on family search, I get nothing. By taking that same search idea and using the filters, you see on the screen, George Key Middleton, I didn't choose any of the other options. I just scrolled down to filters and chose Illinois as my restrict records by in the very first two results that popped up were George and his wife, Josephine. These are records that I had actually never seen before and I didn't know existed. I knew George had spent time in the Soldiers and Sailors Home in Milwaukee, the Wood National Cemetery is where he is buried, but I had absolutely no idea that he had spent time in the state hospital in Illinois as well. So by just simply searching by Illinois, I was able to bring those two records up to really open up my research and give me a lot more information about George and his family. Now, George was a bit of a wanderer. And 
George wasn't necessarily the most upstanding citizen either. My great grandfather had two wives with two families in two different states. So when I do my research, I have to search in all of the places where I know George lived. So I would run this search for Illinois and I would look for records. Then I would change that to Minnesota and then I would change it to Wisconsin and then I would change it to Iowa and then I would change it to New York and do that for each place that I know personally that he lived. You can also layer those filter results too. So I could say that I wanna look for George in Minnesota but I only want to see census records. And I can sort that way as well. Every time you click on a census, like every time you click on one of the search filters, it adds it to the top of your page so you know exactly what filters you're using. So in this case, I've used residents that he's living in Minnesota. I used census because I was just looking for census information. And I chose birthplaces being New York. I didn't put in a date. I didn't put in the name of his spouse. I just chose those three categories and the three records that it brings up, the record at the bottom potentially could be him, but I don't know until I investigate a little bit further. So when I click on that link, it brings up the original image so I can see the page and then it gives me the abstract of it. So it tells me that George Middleton is married to Catherine Middleton. They have several children, Frank, Annie, Mary, Elizabeth, and Robert. I'm pretty sure that this is my family. I might not be 100% sure. Like I said, he had two wives in two states. So I could do one of two things. I could add that to my family tree, kind of put it in my little shoebox there, or I can download it and keep looking and keep investigating to see what else I can find. That's an option and I would recommend that. But keep in mind, the more filters you use, the fewer results you're going to receive. So we saw that I only had only received three results on that particular search because of the layers of filters that I had. So you might have to play with it. And you also have to keep in mind too that not all information will be recorded accurately. So when I did my search on those filters, I didn't see the Minnesota State Census in 1885 for one reason. I had chosen to filter by birthplace of New York. And in the 1875 census, George isn't listed as being born in New York. George is indexed as being born in Minnesota. So remember, the more searches you, more search filters you use, the fewer results you're gonna get, but it also doesn't account for times when mistakes are made. So you have to play with it just like you would play with anything else. So by okay. going back and taking birth location out, it pulled up this record for me to be able to compare that George is married to Catherine in 1875 and they have six children by the time the next census is done in 1885. Okay, hi Tina. I have another question from Judith. Yep. Uh, Judith wants to know um, why doesn't searching on the name only being in, in, in Illinois. I, I, there's a couple questions here, but she has a question about searching for the name in the, I believe Judith, it's from the, the difference between the, uh, ca the filter results and then the general search. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it's a little bit of the logic, like why isn't it showing up in one area, but it's showing up in the other? And that's a very good question. And I can't necessarily explain why it does that, but when I went in and did a search, that initial search just put in George K. Middleton, just like I did in my other searches, and put his residence place of Illinois, I got zero results. And I don't know if that's because of the algorithm that they're using in the general family search historical collections page search, um, but I do know that by choosing the filters, I got a much more accurate result. So all I can say is try it with a name that you're familiar with, that you have records for, to see the difference because it really is startling how many more pertinent and reliable records that are the person I'm looking for that come out of searching by filters than what comes out of just doing a name search in those first set of boxes. I know that doesn't Beautiful. really answer the question, but um, use the best thing you could do is use, use a name that you know that you've documented fairly deeply and see that difference between the two. Excellent. Thank you very much. It really is startling. I mean, it, it's quite surprising. So here's something fun. 
and some of you might already do this. I don't think I'm special in any way, but you can actually use Family Search in tandem with other collections. So I'm kind of cheap. I don't want to admit it, but I don't like to have to pay for things if I can find it someplace for free. So often when you get to a paid subscription site and you want to view a record, you'll have to pay either it's a number of credits or a number of dollars or for a monthly subscription to be able to view that record. But the potential is there to be able to see the exact same record on Family Search once you know what it is you're looking for. So I'll give you an example. I use Scotland's people a lot to research my um, Scottish families. So I can go in to Scotland's people. I can search their indexes for free. There's absolutely no cost to me to search the indexes. So I can go in and I can find probables. I can find potential relatives or people that I'm looking for. But instead of paying the six credits or the 10 credits that it might be to be able to view that record to find out for certain whether or not it's my ancestor, I can take that same information and search family search to see if I can find them as well. This is a really good example would be the Scottish federal census because you can search by specific people on Scotland's pe people, um, but then you have to pay to see the result. I could take that info and convert it into family search and do the same thing. This is one that I happen to do with a birth, a marriage record for Stephen Finley and his wife, Sibylla Wiley. So I went into family search under collections. So I could go into by location. I could click on the UK and choose Scotland and then choose Scotland marriages as my search, or you could go into that collections button at the bottom and put in Scotland and see what comes up. And in this case, it brings up Scottish marriages for me. And I can go in and I can do the same thing. I can put in Stephen Finley. I can search for that record. It says the marriage was on June 6, 1811. If I go back, I see 6, 6, 1811, and I can be fairly certain that I'm looking at the same marriage, that I'm looking at the same couple. And then from there, I can click on that link. There's not a visual image for it, but I could click on that link and I could get the abstract of the record. So the name of the couple, the date they were married, where they're married, um, to figure out whether or not that's the couple that I'm looking for. And then if I wanted to, I could do one of two things. If I'm at a family search library, if I'm at a family history center, if I'm at an affiliate library, then I could go into the card catalog and try to pull up that record directly and get a copy of it. Or if it's unavailable, I can go back to Scotland's people knowing that I'm fairly certain I've got the right couple and spend the money to buy a copy of it. So I wanna give you Cook County as an example. And I know we're being recorded, so I'm, I'm going to tamper my statement here. So once again, Cook County genealogy is offline. It has been offline more times since January of 2019 than it has actually been up and running. That is all I'm going to say about it. I'm gonna take a deep breath and I'm gonna let it go. But through the Legacy Go link for Cook County Clerk's Office, normally, you would be able to go in and you would be able to search birth, marriages, and deaths, depending on the date of the record. For deaths, it's 20 years. For marriages, it's 50 years. For births, it's 75 years as a governor. And search by name. And it would bring up the date and it would bring up the certificate number. So I would be able to then take that date and certificate number and put it into Family Search to find the original. So imagine in your mind's eye that I was looking at the Cook County Clerk's genealogy page and I had pulled up the index page for the wedding certificate for Graham Stewart and his wife Nellie Pullman. So again, I can go into locations or I can go directly into collections and I can choose Illinois Cook County marriages from 1871 to 1920. So in that record, I put in Graham Stewart. I don't put a date, I don't put his spouse's name, mostly because Graham Stewart is a pretty unique name and there's only a couple of them. If you're looking for Jim Johnston, you might wanna put in a, a date range or you might wanna put in a spouse name. But for Graham, I'm fairly certain that I can search just by name. So of the 1,764,000 records that are in there, when I do my search, it brings up a couple of results. The very first one at the top has Graham Stewart listed off to the right. You can kind of see it in the background. 
spouse is Nellie A. Pullman. Okay, I know I've got the right person now. He's 25, she's 23, tells me where they're born, where they're living, what their age is. But then it gives me something that's really going to help me dig deeper. If you click where it says on the right hand side, I, I popped up open that red box. It's got that little arrow. It's not always, it's not open. So you have to click on that little arrow to open up those records. But what that gives you is where to locate it in the family search catalog. And I'm, I don't know if Jen talked about this a week ago when she was talking about the family search catalog, but if you're at an LDS center at the library in Salt Lake City, or if you're at an affiliate library like my library in Plainfield, like Deb's library, there's a lot of affiliate libraries in the Chicagoland area. I can then take that film number and the image number to get a copy of the original certificate without having to send a snail mail letter to Cook County now in order to get a copy of that certificate. So I okay, just jot down. Yeah. Yeah, I apologize. So uh, Deborah, not me, but another Deborah, who's also equally amazing. Does this <laughs> apply for all this? Does this apply for all counties? And unfortunately, Deb, no. this is just for Cook County. Yeah, you can use this model. You can use this concept to, to search for record collections to see if they exist. So there are some Illinois marriages that exist. There are some other states marriage records that exist. I'm just using Cook County as an example because actually Cook County is one of the hardest to search. And that's why I'm kind of using that as my example. If you were to look up Lake County marriages, it would be way simpler. If you were to look up Will County marriages, it would be way simpler because there's fewer of them. So there aren't as many microfilm reels. So I take that film number, I jot it down. And then I take that image number and I jot it down. And then what I do is I go to the card catalog. So I click on catalog at the top. I click on fiche number. I type in that number. If I were at a family, I should have done this from my computer yesterday at work. That would have uh, been easier but so if you click on that number and do a search it brings up the collection and you might think well that doesn't help I was expecting a, a big robust collection of records you have to click on where it says marriage licenses 1871 and 1920 when you click on that link it does bring up a huge list of microfilm now it'll ask you in red, do you want to search the marriages online? No, you do not, because that's the record we were just looking at that did not have the image. This is back to that concept of browsing, like I was talking about earlier, about how I can click on a record collection through that microfilm reel image by image as if I were sitting in front of a microfilm reader. This is the exact same thing. So we don't want to search the online index because we want to browse the collection. And beneath this, so it gives me in red, Cook County Marriage is available online. If you were to scroll down on your screen, it would give the subject that it's vital records. If you were to scroll down from there, it would start listing the microfilm real numbers. I'm not going to drive myself crazy by trying to find that six or seven digit number. I'm just going to go up to edit at the top of my screen and look for it in the page. So when I click on edit and I choose find it in this page, at the bottom of my screen, it drops a little box that says, okay, find it. So then I'm gonna type in that 1030 108 record number and it's gonna bring me right to that record link on the page so that I don't have to search for it. So then from there, I know I'm looking for 1030 108. Here it has a key because we're outside of the building. If you were at an affiliate library, if you were at my library, if you were at Deb's library, if you were in our parking lot because our Wi-Fi signal stretches into the Plainfield Public Library parking lot, not that I want you to all drive there today and do this, but you would be able to then have access. This would no longer be locked. It would no longer have a key above it. And you would be able to pull up that microfilm collection. You would be able to type in image 614 and it would take you right to the marriage certificate for Graham and for Nellie Pullman. So like hey, I said, T. Cook County is much more complicated than some other smaller counties. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so I have a question, quick question from Kathy. Uh, she, doesn't the, she wants to know, doesn't the Illinois Vital Statistics records have all of the Cook County, I'm sorry, what, doesn't Illinois Vital Statistics records have all of the Cook County records? 
I'm not sure I'm understanding what you mean by Illinois. So she wants to know, like, you're, you're getting it through Family Search. <clears throat> you're, we have a couple of problems with, with Cook County. Yes. Can't you just bypass them by going to Illinois Bureau of, of the, the Illinois um, Health Department or something along those lines to get Cook County records? If you want to pay for it. These you don't have to pay for. So up until 1920-ish, you can view the collection like I showed you from the link above here up to 1920. After 1920, you can still get access to Cook County marriage records for free through FamilySearch up into the 1940s. So I have all of my grandparents' marriage records um, up into 1942, 1943, but I do it in a different way. So for example, I would go to Cook County genealogy page once it's up and running again. I put in the name of the couple, it gives me the date and it gives me the certificate number. So while I'm using the certificate number um, to track it, like what we see here, marriage licenses 3844, um, 38844 to, to 40,221, know, 40, I'm going to take that number and I'm going to do the same thing, only they're not under Cook County, they're under Illinois State by county. So I wouldn't go directly into Cook County. I would go to the Illinois State Marriage Licenses and then look by county, which is a completely different record set, which is with a completely different set of microfilm numbers. And I realize that that's complex and it's hard to explain over a webinar, but you can still get Cook County records for certain things all the way up into the 40s and for deaths all the way up into the 80s if you just know which collection in family search to search and whether or not they're accessible from an affiliate library. So yes, family search has all of those microfilm reels for, for Cook County after the 1940s, but they're not filmed yet. So you won't see a camera, so you won't be able to search it, but they have it. So if you went to Salt Lake City, you'd be able to view it in person, but they're digitizing as fast as they can. And with a record collection as huge as Cook County, they have not done all of those microfilm reels yet. And then certain record collections and certain organizations have different lockdowns on their records. So some records just aren't available at all to anybody outside of Salt Lake City. So if you're doing German research, um, there are certain collections that are only accessible, even though they've been digitized and even though that they've been microfilmed, are only available to you if you're a member of the LDS Church. So even if you're in Salt Lake City, you don't have access to certain records if you're not a member of the LDS Church. So there's all types of rights, permissions, and, and collections access, um, which would be an entire class all on its own. Um, but there's still plenty of things that are accessible and available to you um, by using other collections in tandem. One other example, would be something like find a grave. You know, you find a record in find a grave, you know, that gives you the date of death in the county or the place where they're buried, and then kind of backtrack that to look to see, oh, well, does, you know, Macapin County in Illinois have death certificates that are on family search for that time period? Let's go looking for that death. So there are ways to use other sites outside of family search to, to really push your research to the next level. So I apologize, I know Cook County is a very complex example, but I know a lot of us have Cook County ancestry. So I wanted to use that as an example to kind of help you understand that there's more to family search and you can dig deeper than just what's in the database by using the database to then get into the records collections. Another way to do that is by using family search images. Now family search images is different than their photo collections. So what Family Search Images does is it allows you to get into collections without necessarily having to go through the catalog. So what that means is I can search by a location and it's gonna show me all of the collections that have digital images that are tied to that particular location. So I cannot search by um, name, I wouldn't be able to put in George Middleton and have it bring up anything for me, but I would be able to search by location. So for example, Pullman, I could search on Chicago and Pullman is a part of Chicago. It's a neighborhood of Chicago. Um, but when you're looking in a big city, sometimes it's worth it to break out the neighborhood to see if there's a collection. So like I can search for Ayrshire, Scotland, 
but I can also search for androsin or I can search for air or I can search for finic. So sometimes you could start small by looking to see if the individual little hamlet or city or town is listed. If it's not, then start to look a little broader, maybe the township, maybe the county, maybe the state, just to see what's available. But if I put in Chicago or I put in Pullman or I put in Bridgeport, Connecticut, I can click on search image groups and it brings up this list of collections that'll pop up kind of above and block where it says Pullman. So I can search specifically for military records. I can search specifically for divorce records or uh, migration, immigration records. So you could see the types of collections that you can narrow by. Some of them are pretty peculiar. Coming of age and recognition are a little unusual. Um, but it, it's still a way to narrow down when you're dealing with huge collections like Boston or LA or Miami. And what they'll provide you is that DGS number, which is the Digital Genealogical Society number. And if I go back a little bit, those are the numbers that you see. The you know, digital folder number or the GS film number, that's where you would plug that in. So I did a search on Chicago. And it brings up like 41 pages in 3,800 results. Here's where I can go into those collections and sort by um, topics. So I can choose military and it's gonna sort it to just Chicago record collections with images by topic. In this instance, I sorted specifically by naturalization records by clicking on that migration tab and it brings up two pages worth of district court naturalization records which family search has been spending a considerable amount of time digitizing so these are records district court records live at the national archives on pulaski they are digitizing these and making them available on family search as soon as they're available on family search you no longer have access in person to see the original they will tell you these images are digitized. You have to go to Family Search to access them. So I can go in and I can see if I can find the naturalization record based on either the record number or the date range to dig deeper into these. Here's another example of taking those records in tandem. So if you've ever gone to Ancestry and you've looked at the US court immigration records for Northern Illinois, they're based on the Soundex and they're just the little card files. So they would show you the name of the person, it would show you their naturalization number, and it would give you the date and the place location. You can take that number off of that card file in Ancestry and plug it in here to find the original record. So when I click on that link, it brings up this page in the background. What's important is that information that's off to the right-hand side, which is going to give me the source citation and the additional information about that record group and that collection, so that if I wanted to look at more, I could go back to the catalog and see what else is available. So that information on the right, I've now popped out and highlighted here in yellow, it tells me that that microfilm reel that I was looking at a second ago, it gives me the DGS number, that Digital Genealogical Society number, that I can then plug back into the card catalog to see what else is available. Remember what I said about you could search the name index, you could easily do that, but sometimes browsing might help you as well. So below it, you see the little camera, so I know those reels are available. I'd be able to click on those from home and go through those naturalizations. So images get overlooked quite a bit. Um, I don't think people realize the usefulness of them. It's just another way to get into the catalog in another sense. So it's just like using social media. If my library decides that they're gonna put something out on Facebook, if I'm using Twitter, I'm never gonna see it. By making it available across multiple platforms on their website, it makes it more discoverable um, to people who are searching for that type of information. So images is really just another extension of the catalog to kind of highlight and promote those digital collections. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on family trees or genealogies um, just simply because, you know, we want to focus on 
actually digging in and doing some research, you certainly can use the family trees in the genealogies in order to find information on your ancestor. It's a great way to collaborate and to share information. I am very leery of the family trees because they are 100% collaborative. Anybody can make changes. The good news is it keeps a track of those changes and lets you know who's making those changes and when. Um, but the information is, you know, fluid. People can change and add things to trees all the time. So um, it could be a bit overwhelming. The neat thing about it is you can set up a watch list. So across the top, you can search for a person. You could see what's new in that tree. You can look at an individual person or you can click on lists and you can create a list. So I could say, I wanna see every time somebody adds information about George K. Middleton and it'll send me a message when that happens. So sometimes that could be useful to you as well. So I did a search. I wanted to be as specific as I could in this instance because it is a family tree. So I want to get specifically my George Key Middleton, not just George Middleton's in general. And what it does is it brings up the type of information that people have already put together into family trees. And underneath the names, you see those letters and numbers. Those are a way to track specific records. So I'm going to show you how to do that in just a second. But I can see that the top record is certainly who I'm looking for because Rob, I know his parents are Robert Middleton and Abigail Page. So I would be able to click on that particular family tree or that result. And it's gonna bring up the tree that's been created. If I go back one slide, again, I'm in find. So if I scroll down, see at the bottom on the left where it says find by ID, if somehow you have one of those ID numbers because somebody jotted it down in a family tree that they sent to you, you would be able to type in that ID number and it would pull that record up specifically. So you'd be able to look at a specific record in a specific tree. So that's what those letters and numbers represent, the individual records that are going into the massive collection of the family trees. Like I said, I can see when information is being added and by whom. So I can see that my cousin, Stacy Middleton, has added a number of records for our great-grandfather. Um, she sourced them, she's pulled them directly out of Family Search's collection, and she's added that information here. But there's a lot of other things that you could do too. It's a, a way that you can tell personal stories. You can upload personal individual family photos or videos or audio files if you happen to have them. So the trees aren't just based on the records that are coming from within. Um, family search, you have the ability because they're collaborative to add and share additional details. So family search genealogies are different than the family tree. They tie together in a couple of ways because you can pull those records in to a family search family tree, but the genealogies look at a variety of historical records kind of across the board. So the International Genealogical Index is no longer updated. The pedigree resource file, again, no longer updated. So the information you're gonna find in the genealogies is um, stagnant. They're not adding to these collections other than the partner and community trees in the Guild of One Name Studies. The rest of those collections um, haven't been updated in a period of time. So while the information can still be useful and you could still take that information to dig deeper to verify the source, um, they're not continuing to update those collections. So if I go in and I do a search, it tells me there is a record for George K. Middleton that is listed in the pedigree resource file. If I were to click on that link, it would just take me to a static tree that was created. So it doesn't link me to any of the active family trees. It's just an individual record showing connection that was pulled out of either the IGI or out of the pedigree resource file. So it doesn't expand from here because there's no additional information. It's just the source that it's showing that Anna is the child and actually is the child of George K. Middleton and Catherine Ryan. So I want to spend just five minutes to talk about books. I think I'm going to come very close to ending on time, which is a considerable feat for me. So thank you all for being patient. Um, but if you haven't really gone in and played with Family Search books collections, if you do nothing else today, 
take five minutes to search through their book collections. So while yes, there are dozens of book collections that are available online, there's Internet Archive, there's Hathi Trust, there's Google Books, the uniqueness of family search books is the fact that it has thousands upon thousands of family histories, genealogies, company newsletters, family newsletters published after that copyright date of 1924. So I can do a search in family search books and find family quarterly newsletters up into the 90s and the 2000s that I wouldn't be able to find online from any other place because of the copyright policies. So they have books from not only their library in Salt Lake City, but they have things from Mid-Continent Public Library in Independence, Missouri, Allen County Public Library, Denver and or, uh, Dallas and Houston Public Library, um, Cincinnati. Uh, they've got really, really strong, deep research ties all over the country as well as all over the world. So you won't walk away without finding something. And the beauty of it is it's text searchable. So I can search by the title. If I know I'm looking for um, Perry County um, history, I could put that in. But I can also search by person, by occupation, by railroad, um, any way that you can think to search, you have the ability to search in this record collection. So I went in and did a search on George K. Middleton. I put it in quotations because I just wanted to find George K. Middleton. Now keep in mind, he could be JK or GK, he could be George Middleton, he could be George Key Middleton. There's a variety of ways his name could be spelled and you'd wanna try all of those. But I just put in George K because that's what he went by predominantly and it brought up two results. Now, if you remember from the record I showed you for the census, he was living in Clay County with his wife, Katie. He shows up in the history of Clay County. He also shows up in the Hendershot Researchers Newsletter from 2001. That was huge for me because I know that one of his descendants is a Hendershot, but I had absolutely no idea that the Hendershots put out their own family newsletter for 13 years. This is volume 13. So they've been doing this for a considerable amount of time. Now the downside is because these are recent, they're considered protected. So I cannot download the newsletter, but if I were to click on full text results, it would show me where in the newsletter his name is mentioned. And then I would be able to contact somebody to see about getting a copy of that particular page or that particular newsletter. So in this particular instance, I can't download the entire PDF, um, but at least I know I've got a lead to go dig deeper into these Hendershot researchers newsletters. But I can do that with other things. So I did a search on International Order of the Odd Fellows because I had several of my Scots who were members of the Odd Fellows, and it brought up page after page of digitized books on the Odd Fellows all across the country. So I chose the Proceedings of the Grand Lodge from 1901. When I click on that record, it asks me, do I want to view all 168 pages? Why, yes, I do. I want to be able to go through that. So if I were to click on that link, it would take me to an additional page where I could then browse through that issue page by page by page. But two things I want you to keep in mind, and then that will be the end of my presentation, is that down in the bottom left corner, you have that little Rubik's Cube square. If you were to click on that, it would show you multiple pages at once. So if you knew you were looking for a specific image in a book, you'd be able to see all of the pages or several pages at once to be able to then go directly to the page you need. But then next to the little hourglass or the little magnifying glass where I'm going to search for George in this particular volume is the download button. So if it's listed as public and it's available to be downloaded, you'll see on the bar that little down arrow, which would allow you to then download the entire PDF to use in your research. So this is gonna be good for cemeteries. This is going to be good for railroads if you're looking for you know, employees of the Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe. So there are a lot of ways that you could use these records, download them and then search for your ancestor. And then you have all your source citation available to you. One thing I want you to keep in mind not everything is spelled the same. And you have to be aware of that when you're searching. So I did a search for Oakwood Cemetery and it brought up 18,000 results. 
over 18,000, 18,281 results for Oakwood Cemetery. So Oakwood Cemetery is all across the world. But how many times have you seen cemetery misspelled? So I went in and searched for Oakwood Cemetery, C-E-M-A-T-E-R, you know, and got 41 results. I went in and spelled it C-E-M-E-T-A-R-Y, which is a common misspelling, and got over 2,100 results. So keep in mind, when you are searching the books, especially the books, but when you're searching the records as well, you have to take into account the opportunity for misspelling. So whether that's in a name, somebody misspells George Key and makes it George Keys or George Kearns or George some other way, you have to take into account for that and you have to search that way as well. So thank you, everybody. Hopefully it gave you some new ideas and some new places to look. Um, and then I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks, Tina, for the presentation. I really appreciate it. We had a couple requests for uh, Tina to show her face, her beautiful ah. face during the presentation. All Jeffrey, right, are on. we able to do proof of life? <laughs> <laughs> hold on, I'm going to start. Hi, everybody. Can you see me? Yeah. There's Deb. Hi, Deb. You can stop sharing your screen if you like. Yeah. <laughs> you know I'm alive. You know I'm safe. Pardon the fact that I do have allergies. I don't have COVID. I can smell. I can taste things. But if my voice sounds a little rough, it's just because it's allergy season. Lucky me, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, just a couple of things. Did anybody have any questions from the event today? Uh, we did have a thank you from Gail. So Gail did say thank you. She found her uh, I believe she found her great uncle's immigration card image. So thank you, Tina, for pointing that out. We really appreciate it. Fantastic. And um, there were a couple other, were there any other questions before we let class out today? You guys know how to find me or Deb if you have further questions. My right. email address is on there. You can always send me a message. I'm happy to help you out. Okay. Debbie Fields says thank you. Thank you, Debbie, for coming today to the session. We really appreciate it. While you all are figuring out what you're going to do, just a couple quick announcements. Oh, we got another one. Thank you. Very well done. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Nancy. You know, everybody's really lovely. Thank yous all the way around. So just a reminder, guys, that's coming up on Friday at 11 a.m., uh, same bat time, same bat channel, we're going to be having Jen Warner back for doing a program on finding your Mayflower ancestors. So that's gonna be fantastic. And then I'm very super happy to tell you guys that next Tuesday, uh, which is the 28th at 11 a.m., I'm gonna be back here for a free genealogy session on using Fold3 Library Edition. Ooh. So I want you guys to be back back ready to do some research on uh, Friday and then on Tuesday. Registration links are up in our Facebook page, the Fountaindale Genealogy Club Facebook page. I've posted it all over and it's also available on the events area, calendar events area of the Fountaindale website. So really excited to have you guys with us. If you have a Fountaindale library card, remember you can get Fold3 from home. So if you have a check with your local library as well, if you're joining us from a different library, check to see if they offer Fold3 from home as well. I want you guys all to learn about it because Tina doesn't really like Fold3. I love Fold3. It's a lovely well, I love relationship. Fold3. It has its I, benefits. I love Fold3. Uh, but uh, the search mechanisms are really difficult sometimes, guys. So we're uh, that's okay. I'm going to walk you through on how to browse successfully and get the search results that you need. So we're going to do a little browsing, a little searching. It's going to be a little fun. So anything else before you uh, toddle off, Tina? No, thanks, everybody. I hope everybody's staying in and staying well. And I can't wait to see all of your smiling, shiny faces, hopefully sometime soon. We right, really great. do miss all of you. <laughs> we miss you guys so much. I mean, my cats are great, but you know, human contact is also important too. Oh, I mean, I, I miss you guys so much, you know, but here was the thing. We were talking to T earlier before the session. Do you guys want a Tina's pandemic lecture? <laughs> She's got one on the pandemic of 1918. You guys yeah, I've been doing that one lecture? for years. It's scary how uh, pertinent it is right now. Yeah, I know. I, I even I go went back and said that people are thinking like this is all amazing. Oh, Dawn says yes, yeah, she wants the pandemic lecture. Hey, you know, I'm also working on um a what was it? A World War One ration recipe from Win the War Cookbook from 1918 for a one egg sponge pudding. I've made it three times. It's so delicious. I'm going to make a video so you guys can see it. 
Yes yeah, well, Deb's making sponge question. pudding. I'm making tamales. I don't know. You oh. can choose whose house you want to visit. Hey, my, mine's delicious. It's it looks delicious. delicious. I mean, really, the pictures were quite impressive. Oh, man. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it live. Well, I'm going to record it and then have it up so you guys can watch it. But it's one egg and little. Oh, and yes to the pudding video. Yes, we'll do pudding <laughs> and, and, and we'll have pan, pudding and pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are that sounds like Danny quite K. the quite the marriage. Yeah, it is. We are doing the Danny K. Uh, we are doing the Danny K. Bing Crosby situation here. See so how much that, we miss you guys. We miss you guys so much. Okay, well, um, thank you. Oh, Kayla's making schwans. Well, I can I can say that's mm-hmm. fantastic. Jean says yes to the pandemic lecture, and Dave says yes to everything all around him. So <laughs> I guess I'll have to book you, T. So let's 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 plan something for May and. Um, I will get my I will get my World War One sponge cake, uh, sponge pudding video done this week, and we'll post it. And if you guys need anything else from us, please don't hesitate to give us an email. We're happy to do a, a little uh, work together and kind of see what you guys are doing on your research. And um, I'm just sitting at home doing work from home, so please email me. And if you guys need some help with your research, let's get some research done together. This is going to be a lot of fun. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. And Tina, thank you so much for your time. And everybody, thank you so much for coming out today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Debs. Thanks, Jeffrey. All right. Thank-